The waters that wash against the shores of Prince Edward Island hold forever the secrets of the strange tale of the seagoing coffin. If that is so, then let the journey begin to a place known as Fortune Harbor. The story of the seagoing coffin that began as Odyssey in the Gulf of Mexico and ended up on the Prince Edward Island shore was reported in international newspapers and magazines, including Ripley's Believe It or Not. The central figure in this maritime mystery was an actor of the 1890s. He was tall, handsome, and magnetic. Charles Coughlin was the John Barrymore of his day. One report says he was born in England in 1841, while others claim Prince Edward Island as his place of birth. While doing research for an article on Fortune Harbor and Abel's Cape and its people, Adele Townsend discovered there was another group living in the area, actors and writers from New York City, and the main character was one, Charles Coughlin. Yes, Coughlin was one of them. And uh, he is the only one that has uh, any uh, marker today to mark the, that era, but there is a stone to, uh, to him in Fortune Cemetery. Charles Coughlin was the center of that famous colony. He was a darling of the female population, a rapscallion of the first order. While in Paris and under the influence, he married a young actress. He had a wife at the time back in New York. While appearing on stage in Galveston, Texas in 1899, Charles Coughlin collapsed and died before reaching hospital. Against his wishes, he was buried in a Galveston graveyard and not Fortune Harbor. The following year, a violent hurricane swept in from the Gulf and claimed over 6,000 lives. The flood that followed washed most of the graves into the Gulf Stream, including Coughlin's coffin. For the next eight years, night and day, and in every kind of weather, Charles Coughlin's coffin simply disappeared somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, or so it was thought. Believe it or not, the coffin bearing the body of Charles Coughlin drifted eastward in the currents of the Gulf Stream, up to Florida, Massachusetts, and Maine coast, and into the waters of the Northumberland Strait. The coffin then drifted in the waters of Abel's Cape to the beach of Fortune Harbor. Two fishermen who came upon the coffin were somewhat hesitant. Should they or should they not open it? Curiosity got the better of them. Charles Coughlin's wish was finally granted. His coffin carried him home to the island he loved, 3,000 miles from where he had been buried eight years earlier. That is folklore, yes. And uh, Harry Burke was an, uh, an older man, quite an older man, uh, when I moved to Fortune here. And uh, uh, he had stories about about that coffin coming into Fortune, Fortune Bay, Fortune River. It seems a bit um, hard to believe, but uh, there were lots of stories of that type at that, at that time. And there are other people who live along the shores of Abel's Cape who swear the story is true. Adele's husband, Cliff, who grew up on the Coughlin tale, says it's an attraction and one of the best maritime mysteries. Oh, it is. It's an intriguing story, yeah. yeah. 
That's why you're here, I guess. <laughs> Out of all of these confused accounts of fact and fiction, the legend makers have woven together in the folklore of Prince Edward Island the mystery of the seagoing coffin. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen. Dedicated in 1910, the Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax is a landmark. Over the ensuing years, many memorials have been added to the cathedral. The great stained glass window over the altar commemorates the sacrifices of those who died in the Great War. The carved oak woodwork is some of the most elaborate in Canada. There is something else in this church besides the Holy Spirit. Back in the 30s, the then dean of the cathedral, John Plummer Lloyd, died. It wasn't long after his untimely death, some members of the congregation began to notice the good dean wasn't where he was supposed to be, in his grave. Members of the congregation have seen the ghost of Dean Lloyd during services. Dean Austin Monroe knows about the ghost and those who claim to have seen a spirit in the church. On a Sunday evening, about two weeks after he died, that there were some people in the, uh, sitting in the cathedral waiting for the evening service to start, and uh, uh, two people testified that they saw the uh, ghost of Dean Lloyd uh, come into the pulpit and uh, stand and stare out over the congregation and then uh, uh, went his way. attended that Sunday night service, went to the priest and told him that she was somewhat concerned and even frightened that she thought she had seen Dean Lloyd walking about the church and even going up into the pulpit. The young priest assured her that she did not see Dean Lloyd. What she had seen was his ghost. And yes, he too had seen the apparition. Dean Lloyd's death in 1933 was not a natural or easy one. He died from injuries sustained while on an errand of mercy, struck down by an automobile. The ashes of other clergymen and parishioners are enshrined in the walls of the cathedral. Dean Lloyd's are not. Perhaps his spirit is restless because of the way he died. There are other reports of people who claimed to have seen the shadow of someone moving about the church. One evening, while playing the organ, a highly respected member of the church knew he wasn't alone. Someone else was there. He looked up and he saw Dean Lloyd walking up the aisle of the cathedral, and uh, the dean went up to the crossing by the vestry door near the communion rail, and then went into the vestry and uh, Ralph Silver testified that he got up off the organ bench and ran into the uh, vestry and had a, to see what was going on, and there was nobody there. On a quiet autumn evening, while spending a brief moment of contemplation and solitude in the cathedral, some may even see shadows and feel a wave of cold air as if someone is passing by. so many people fascinated by the ghost story? Perhaps to be scared while in the safety of their living rooms? Perhaps it has something to do with the unknown. 
And that's where this evening's maritime mystery takes us into the unknown. So let the journey begin. When William Wynot, known to his friends as Willie Boy, stepped outside the local watering hole, his mind was on something other than where he was stepping. All it took was one wrong move and it was all over. Willie Boy never knew what hit him. He felt no pain, saw only a burst of light. The next thing he knew, he was sitting in his mother's parlor, surrounded by family and friends. Naturally, he was wondering how on earth he got there. One moment he was stepping off a curb, and the next, back home. He just couldn't figure that one out. Was he dreaming? Willie Boy thought as much. What other explanation was there? Willie Boy knew he was seated in a chair, but he had this strange feeling he was somewhere else in the room. He just couldn't understand or shake the feeling. What was beginning to really irritate him was why everyone was so quiet. You think they were at a wake with all the somber looking faces. That must be it, Willie Boy thought. But if that was the case, who died? Something else was bothering Willie Boy. Why were his relatives and friends staring at him? Some would even touch his forehead with their finger. Why would anyone do such a stupid thing? If he could just raise his head a bit, there it was again. That awful feeling of sitting down and lying down at the very same time. It was, Willie Boy thought, so very strange. There was movement behind him now, people saying goodbye and whispering that it was too bad he's gone. He was such a very nice young man. The next thing he knew, people had their coats on and some were blessing themselves as they passed in front of him. And then, out of the corner of his eye, Willie Boy saw the local undertaker. As soon as he had a chance, he'd ask him who was being waked. Then, in absolute terror, he watched as the undertaker began pulling down some kind of cover over his face. Willie Boy screamed and screamed and screamed, but no one heard him in the darkness. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessam. This impressive structure is located off Highway 101 on the road to Windsor, Nova Scotia, and very little of anything has changed since it was built nearly 200 years ago by Richard John Uniac. Uniac wasn't always a country squire. Royalists of the day accused him of treason. He was arrested, and while on the way to Halifax to face charges, his guards stopped near a lake to rest their horses. The place reminded young Uniac of his home in Ireland, and he made a mental note that if he was cleared of the charge of treason and became a man of means, he would return one day and build his dream home near that lake. The charge of treason against Uniac was dropped, and in time he did become rich and powerful in law and politics, and he did not forget this place. As a young man, Uniac married Martha de Lesternier, who was not quite 13 years old. She bore him 12 children before her death in her early 40s. 
Uniac married again and continued to live the life of a country gentleman until his death at the age of 77. The Uniac estate is not only steeped in history, but in spirits as well. It wasn't long after his first wife Martha died that her ghost made its presence known. Goldie Robertson, a curator at Uniac House, is familiar with the ghost of Martha Uniac. Martha is usually seen uh, outside, roaming around down by the lake, which her husband, Richard John, named after her. And she's uh, strolling along by the lake and in amongst the beautiful trees. Martha's ghost is not doomed to wander alone. She was joined in the spirit world by her own daughter, Lady Mitchell. Lady Mitchell was Richard John and Martha's eldest daughter, Mary. She married Admiral Sir Andrew Mitchell, and unfortunately, a year after they were married, the Admiral um, contacted uh, malaria down in Bermuda and died. They had one daughter. In 1825, uh, uh, Lady Mitchell died at the age of 43. Her ghost has been seen in the house here with Lady Mitchell in this very room at the piano. And it has been said that Lady Mitchell has been seen coming down the beautiful staircase, going into the bedroom at the foot of the stairs and sitting on the foot of the bed and having a conversation with her mother, Martha, sitting in the rocking chair. There are other ghostly sounds in the home that Richard Uniac built. One worker left in a hurry after hearing footsteps coming up the stairs. At the time, he was alone in the house. Thousands of people visit Uniac House every year, and some will never return, afraid of what's inside. One family in particular a few years ago uh, was visiting here and they were looking in the spare bedroom at the foot of those stairs and they said they could feel a presence or a spirit and they were very upset and left immediately without going through the rest of the house. Next time you visit Uniac House, look beyond the obvious. Who knows who may be watching from the top of the stairs or peering out from behind the hemlocks. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessup. Heavy fog sweeps in from the sea and covers Shabakto Head Lighthouse. Dreams become nightmares. Children huddle together in the blackness of their room. A rush of cold air sweeps over their bed. No radio plays, but 19th century music is heard above the forlorn sounds of a foghorn. As a small child, Pat Halpert lived with her family at Chibacto Head Light. She remembers how she dreaded the long hours of the night and prayed for sleep in daylight. Pat recalls her first encounter with the ghost. I was walking the dog out around the house, and the dog started to growl, and her ears went up straight, and I glanced over to where she was looking, and I saw this 
vision of this woman floating across the rocks. She was dressed in uh, late 18th century, um, a large bonnet with a bubble back and a long gown, tight, at, tight fitting at the waist and, and full at the bottom. And uh, it was tied around the waist with a rope. And um, there was no, I didn't see a face. There was no, no color. She was basically all one, like, um, if I can recall, it was like a grayish, grayish, brownish color, just, you know. Pat felt the ghost wanted something from the living. She recalled sea tragedies of shipwrecks and bodies that were buried in unmarked graves. Perhaps the ghost could not rest until she found a lost child or husband. When the family finally moved from the lighthouse, that was later told about a radar technician who was caught in a violent winter storm and had to take refuge in the abandoned house. He took a cot over with him and uh, spent the night alone. And uh, his cot was upset while he was in it. And uh, his alarm clock he found in the other corner of the room. And uh, he, he left, and I don't think he ever went back there again either. Stan Fleming, Pat's father, was for years a keeper of Shabakto Light. He scoffed at his daughter's concern about the lighthouse being haunted by a mysterious woman. But a later incident turned Stan Fleming into a believer. Well, I was just sitting there while I was sitting there with the oars under my legs and a little cigarette and popping on the cigarette and the first thing I see this woman <laughs> going across. And I just sat there and looked at I thought, what in the hell is that? <laughs> the me, I thought it was a witch. She had a bonnet tied down over. Never believed in ghosts. Never. But after a while, <laughs> I started wondering. Are these just stories, the figment of the imagination? Pat Helpart doesn't think so. I always had the, uh, a chilled feeling that would, uh, would come over me. Um, it was not there constantly, but a lot of the times. And I just felt that there was someone that was trying to contact me. Someone was trying to get my attention. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen. Strange and unexplained things happen when darkness falls, when the wind rises above the trees and the shadow of the moon falls across the cold grave. Then it is time to gather the children to your bosom and lock out the sounds that rise up from the earth. There are souls unable to rest because of powerful earthly forces, a grieving relative that can't let go of a loved one, perhaps or something the dead did not do or finish when alive. Our story this evening is about an old priest who could not find peace in his grave because death on the altar robbed him of celebrating the Mass. This Cape Breton tale centers around a child, a church, and a spirit that rose nightly from a cold grave. Around the turn of the century, a young boy was forced to spend three nights locked inside a church because he had stolen money from the poor box. Alone and afraid, he spent the first night in the back of the church. At exactly midnight, the boy was startled when suddenly there was a brightness on the altar and the form of a priest began to take shape. With outstretched arms, a voice no louder than a whisper came from deep within the apparition. It wanted someone to help it celebrate the Mass. The child was too frightened to speak. When he finally raised his eyes toward the altar, the ghost was gone. When dawn broke and the boy was allowed to go home, he told no one about what he had witnessed. 
On the second night, the same thing happened. The spirit cried out, pleading for someone to assist it in the mass. Again, the boy did not speak or move. On the third night, an unexplained force moved the child closer to the altar. At exactly midnight, the spirit appeared and with great anguish cried out, who is here to help me? Who is here to help me find peace in my grave? Although frightened, the boy slowly stood and said, I will assist you, Father. And again this force, this unexplained power, moved this frightened child closer to the altar. When the Mass was completed, the child noticed something different about the ghost. It seemed to take on a wholeness, a physical presence as if it was a living person. The voice of the Spirit told the young boy that every night for the last 50 years, it had returned to the church looking for someone to help it complete the Mass. And because of you, the Spirit told the boy, I can now find peace in my grave. And this night, my soul will be at eternal rest in heaven. When the parish priest opened the church doors the following morning, he reminded the young boy of what he had done, and he hoped he was repentant. The young boy was. But he said, you know something, Father? I did something last night I don't think that you'll ever do. I sent an old priest to heaven. Some time ago, on Nova Scotia's eastern shore, a young girl by the name of Ashley took a shortcut home from school. The shortcut meant Ashley had to go through the graveyard. If she ran, nothing could stop or catch her. What was Ashley's concern? What was she afraid of? After all, it's only a graveyard. Still, there are people who will avoid at any cost walking in or near such a place. Some believe graveyards are where spirits live, spirits wanting to make contact with the living. Ashley fought off the fear by telling herself that nothing would happen to her, but to be on the safe side, she wouldn't walk through the cemetery, but would run the gauntlet to the other side. but not on this particular afternoon. For out of nowhere, a woman stepped in front of her. Ashley wanted to run, but she was powerless to move. The woman reached out and took the child's hand and led her away from the graveyard. time, Ashley and the stranger stood on the riverbank under a late afternoon sun. Finally, the stranger told Ashley that she must go on alone and that Ashley should go directly home. Ashley, how'd it go today? Good. I met someone on the way home from school today. I met her by the graveyard. Oh? She walked along with me, and we talked. Well, she talked, but mostly questions. 
What kind of questions? Well, she wanted to know my name, my age, what school I attended. She said she went to school there, and it's a teacher there too. Then she said she had to go back. She turned around and left. When I looked back, she was gone. Where did you say that you met her? By the graveyard. But the funny thing is, I take that route every day, and she wasn't there when I first got there. She just kind of appeared. What did you say her name was? She said she went to school with you. Her name was Grace Forshaw. Ashley, that's impossible. Why? Grace Forshaw died 25 years ago. What? That's impossible. I mean, she was right there. She was right in front of me. She wasn't dead. I know. I know who you're talking about. But Grace Forshaw died 25 years ago. So how many so-called strangers crossed your path today? And was that person looking for directions really a stranger? And have you ever had the feeling that someone is walking beside you, someone who just crossed your path? For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Justin. This remarkable story was unearthed when a new church was built at Kelly's Cross, Prince Edward Island. You remember the story of Father Duffy from our last maritime history? He was the priest that performed the exorcism that drove old daughter's ghost out of the grist mill. Well, the good father has a remarkable story to tell as well. So let the journey begin to Kelly's Cross, Prince Edward Island, and this church where Father Duffy came back for his second wake, his own. Father Duffy died on December 1st, 1860. His wish was to be buried in the shadow of the church so that when the good people of the parish pass by his grave, they may pause and say a prayer for him. When the new church was built in 1898, the parishioners decided to open Father Duffy's grave and bury him in the shadow of the new church so that the people once again may stop and say a prayer for him. So on a December morning in 1900, Father Duffy's body, that was buried 40 years earlier, was exhumed. Local historian Brendan Campbell, who grew up on such stories, recounts what happened next. I can recall an old chap by the name of Sidney Matters that lived to be 96 sitting in my home, and he was there at the second digging up, and uh, he said they pried the casket off. The casket was coming apart, eh, when they were dig dig digging it up. And he said, lo and behold, this Michael Duffy took the shovel and just pried at the lid of it. And when it opened, there was Father Duffy's body in no decomposition of the body whatsoever. Some say his nose, there was a little on the tip of his nose that was sort of flattened down. But even the leather boots that they wore in those days were rotted right off his feet. But the body was there just, just the same as they had laid him 40 years before. There were several witnesses to this amazing tale, including the father of Brendan Flood. He was only 20 years old, and at that time, uh, you know, it was quite a thing for at any time for to see a corpse raised after been buried for 40 years and to have it in the same state as when he was buried. So that's about, the, except for his nose, it was kind of flattened down a little bit from the coffin. The coffin containing Father Duffy was placed in the new church and again he was waked. 
quaked for a second time and his people came from miles around. People came, they just spread like wildfire um, and they came in throngs, young and old, for such a phenomenal thing to happen after a man been in the ground for 40 years to be dug up and in such a state of preservation, eh? They thronged and people walked in from Crapa and there'd be groups of one, two, and three. And uh, you can just imagine the anticipation that would be in their mind, these people, uh, as they walked, thinking of what they were going to see when they arrived at that church. And um, you can just imagine today, if this were to happen today, you can be assured that there would be television cameras there would be journalists there from all over the world. A monument to this very day stands in honor of old Father Duffy and his people remember. In the end, parishioners who passed by Father Duffy's grave said a prayer took a pebble from his grave and placed it against a sore spot and it would be well again. That's what was written in the local paper of that day. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen. Our journey this evening takes us across and over the mouth of the mighty Tuscott River, a river that's dotted with several islands, such as Ball Tuscott, Sheep, Goat, Green, and Surrette Islands. A few of these islands are temporary homes for the fishermen of the region. These islands do not hold our interest, nor do they harbor the dark and mysterious secret that we're attempting to uncover. Our nautical guides take us to a lifeless and barren piece of wasteland jutting out of the mouth of the Tuscan, a place that locals speak of only in whispers, a place known as Murder Island. As far back as the early 1700s, local fishermen spoke of seeing human skulls bleaching on the island shore. Even into the mid-1800s, similar sightings were reported by passing fishermen and these reports of mass murder are still handed down from one generation to the next. Ever since I was a small boy, I, they were telling us that about the Lille de Massac, the, all the bodies that they had found, a thousand or so, and I believe that they, they did find something. There are several explanations as to what really happened to these people. One theory deals with a ship and its crew that set sail from Ireland in the year 1735. High school history teacher Ken Langell believes there's an obvious flaw in the Baltimore theory. The crew uh, was killed by the uh, passengers who were a bunch of Irish cutthroats heading for New England. Uh, they take over the boat, they keep the captain, they throw the crew overboard and the crew would wash ashore here. Possibility, the problem with that theory is that the Baltimore is also located here. Another popular explanation was a smallpox outbreak aboard several ships that were bringing immigrants to North America. According to local legend, these unfortunate souls were thrown overboard and their bodies washed up on the island's beach. The theory favored by Langell is a connection between the mysterious Oak Island money pit and Murder Island. Langell believes when the chamber of Oak Island was finished, its secret would be kept only if the workers were permanently silenced, silenced by murder. Makes sense. You take them to a, a, an isolated point like this, uh, you're sheltered. I mean, there's uh, local stories say there's 300 and some odd islands around us here. You could easily slaughter 500 to 1,000 people. No one would notice a thing. 
leave the bodies on the beach and discussion. And what we really uncovered is yet another maritime mystery. Who and why were 1,000 bodies strewn along the shoreline of Murder Island? There is no documentation or official records of this foul deed, and yet something tragic did happen here because the French settlers of that time named this place aptly Ile au Massacre. I'm Bill Jessica. went to his grave by way of this courtroom and the noose, proclaiming his innocence to the very end. If that is so, then let the journey begin to a jail cell where the spirit of this man still haunts that place. In the late summer of 1878, Thomas Dowd of New River, New Brunswick, and Eliza Ann Ward, wife of Thomas E. Ward, were convicted of Ward's murder. The trial was held in Charlotte County, New Brunswick, in the town of St. Andrews, where residents were, until the trial began, tending to their own business and needs. However, it was standing room only once the trial began. Evidence during the trial revealed Dowd and Mrs. Ward were lovers and that Mrs. Ward was carrying Dodd's child. A local newspaper of the day, the Bay Pilot, reported that the judge wept as he passed the death sentence on Dowd and Mrs. Ward. Mrs. Ward was spared the gallows, but not from any defense strategy by her lawyer, but because she was pregnant. She was given a seven-year sentence instead. While awaiting the hangman's news, Dowd returned to his faith and spent most of his waking hours praying. Then, on the morning of January 14th, 1879, Dowd was taken from his cell and with a candle in his hand, walked to the awaiting gallows just outside the jail. Mrs. Ward requested and was granted permission to watch her lover's hanging from a jail window. During the trial, Dowd maintained his innocence, but near the end, he confessed in writing that it was he and he alone who had killed Thomas Ward and that Mrs. Ward had no part in the murder. The jail that housed Dowd and Ward is now a museum, and according to Charlotte McAdam, the museum's curator, Dowd had an unselfish reason for accepting the blame. It's thought that he did that in order to protect her and possibly his own child. According to records, Mrs. Ward died shortly after serving her sentence. In her personal effects was a letter, a confession. She wrote that she had murdered her husband, not Tommy Dowd, and the people in the community at the time believed that she was the murderer. In time, the community of St. Andrews returned to normal. However, there were abnormal things going on in the jail where Thomas Dowd was held and eventually hanged. Guards reported strange noises during the night and a mysterious beam of light would suddenly appear on the wall of Dowd's cell. Guards reported that it was as if an invisible hand was trying to write a message. One guard said it was Dowd's ghostly hand that scrawled the words, I'm innocent. Jails are full of people claiming their innocence. Thomas Dowd was one of them, or was he? For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessup.
We naturally assume that when we leave our loved ones in the graveyard, they'll remain there, never to be forgotten, but never to be seen again. Well, not in all cases. If that is so, then let the journey begin to a place where Granny had other ideas. The man behind the wheel of the car had been driving since early morning. He'd been away from his family for over a week and is anxious to get home. While passing the graveyard, he saw a frail elderly woman standing by the road. Why he slowed down and stopped remains a mystery. Ordinarily, He'd mind his own business, but something much stronger than common sense overpowered him. He backed the car to where the woman was standing and asked if she needed assistance. She told him she wanted to go home and gave him the address. When he got near the area he believed the woman lived, he turned to ask if they were in the right neighborhood. There was no one in the back seat. The woman had simply vanished. No one will ever convince him that he was imagining things. There was a woman, and she was in his car. He remembered the address she had given him. Perhaps he would find the answer there. A young woman answered his knock. He explained what happened and gave a description of the woman. She told him the woman he described was her mother. They just buried her. They just returned from the graveyard. Churches, battlefields, theaters, and homes have their spirits, and these apparitions rarely stray far from familiar haunts. And some spirits like Granny just wanted to go home, home to familiar surroundings. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessup. This place at one time was the estate of Thomas Chandler Halliburton, the 19th century lawyer, judge, politician and writer. And this is the home he built for his bride. He called it the Clifton House. Others call it the Halliburton Mansion. And it is said that Halliburton's ghost is inside. His spirit is not the only one that roams this place. There is another that haunts it, the ghost of a soldier of the Black Watch. There is more than one, two to be exact. One is old, the other young. Both are forever prisoners of the spirit world. Their world is here on a high hill above the town of Windsor, Nova Scotia. This is the Halliburton Mansion, built in 1836. It is here where the spirit of Thomas Chandler Halliburton dwells. Halliburton was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia in 1796. He was a lawyer, judge, and a politician. Judge Halliburton was also an author. In the mid-1800s, he penned the popular Sam Slick novels. And there is also the spirit of the lone piper whose ghostly music sweeps over the vast Halliburton estate. There are many versions of what caused the piper's death. As far as all the young maidens are concerned, though, there is but one lost love broke his heart.
According to the legend, the tragic death of the young soldier happened while he and his regiment were marching through Windsor to Annapolis Royal. While bivouacking near the Halliburton estate, the young piper had arranged a rendezvous near a pond with his bride-to-be. But death had claimed her. Seeing the ghostly reflection of his love in the pool, the young piper joined her in everlasting sleep. The sad tale of love lost has spread far and wide, and young maidens are told that if they dance near Piper's Pond 13 times, the waters will give life back to the young lovers. Most children, afraid of the unknown and perhaps superstitious, end their ritual dance before reaching the unlucky number 13. And while the spirit of the young piper is forever lost, the ghost of Thomas Chandler Halliburton roams the hallways and corridors of the mansion. It is here in the master bedroom where the Halliburton ghost spends most of his spiritual time. Time spent, according to ghost watchers, discussing politics with his old political friend and foe, Joe Howe. Debbie Kellner has answered more than one question regarding the Halliburton ghost. We had a former owner that um, heard noises of carriages pulling up to the house, would come up and pull up and back, and he'd get up and go and check, and there was no carriage. And when he tried to explain it to people, they didn't believe him. And then there's the stories of the pipers down on the pond. And um, one time there were some ladies that stayed overnight here. It was an inn at that time, and uh, they heard noises through the night, and they put their uh, bureaus and chairs against the door to keep out the noise. And there was an Alsatian dog with them in the house, and he was going quite strange, and that was never explained. And perhaps a Halliburton spirit communicates by pen with that old clock peddler creation of his, Sam Slick of Slickville. Although Halliburton loved Nova Scotia, he loved England more. In the mid-1800s, he moved to Britain. In 1865, and at the age of 69, he died. He was buried in a graveyard by the River Thames. Was it Judge Halliburton's last wish, perhaps an impossible one, to have his body returned to Windsor rather than remain forever under foreign soil? Perhaps that's why Thomas Chandler Halliburton's ghost haunts this place today. And outside, a vigil is also kept by the lonely piper, forever a prisoner of lost love. one look for before buying a house? Well, if the home is a century old, a lot more than a leaky roof. So let the journey begin to a place where the new owners bought a lot more than they bargained for. You never know when buying a home what's included in the purchase until you live in it for a while. Take the case of Cynthia Sharp and her family. They bought this home in Cow Bay, Nova Scotia and according to Cynthia, it was a new adventure for the entire family. An older home with a lot of living in it and perhaps a lot of dying as well. When the family moved in, nothing appeared out of the ordinary. Everything was the way it should be. That is until... Until shortly before the first Christmas we were in the house. 
I was upstairs uh, in the one bedroom, in the spare bedroom, wrapping Christmas presents. And our little dog was right at my feet. And uh, the closet door, the latch on the closet door clicked. The door swung open. The dog's hair stood straight up, and down the steps she flew. The Sharps don't know who the ghost is or whether it's a man or woman. That's because no one in the family has come face to face with the apparition. Several times we'll be sitting in the living room watching TV and uh, when friends and neighbors come to visit they always come to the back door and which means they pass the picture window in the living room. And several times I will have the illusion of somebody walking by and I'll say to my husband, there's someone coming to the door but when he answers it, there's nobody there. When objects in the home are found out of place, such as pictures falling off the wall and plants overturned, it's time to become concerned about what or who is sharing the home with you. There was one more incident that was uh, a bit scary. Uh, we had company, my mother-in-law and family were here. They had come into the kitchen to have tea, and I had gone into another room. As I was coming out, the little stove handle on our wood stove in the hallway went flying through the air and landed into the kitchen. And I just sort of gasped, and uh, my mother-in-law was sitting in the rocker in the kitchen facing that way, and she did say, I saw that. So I'm always glad when someone else sees some of these things. There's a, an antique sled that was mine when I was a little girl, and it's been leaning up against the wall in the upstairs bedroom for years. And last November, I was downstairs typing Christmas letters when the whole house shook with a crash. And uh, I checked everything out and finally made my way upstairs, and there was a sled, not just overturned where it had been standing, but out in the middle of the floor upside down. Perhaps the purchase agreement should include a 30-day sleepover first, just to be on the safe side. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen. Pounding surf smashes against the rocky coastline of northern Cape Breton. The sounds of the ocean echoes inland, but are lost forever in the sweep of the deep valleys and lush meadows of the Cape Breton Highlands. And sitting majestically above the high cliffs is Celtic Lodge, a place where the weary traveler may spend a night or an eternity. All the lands in the original buildings were owned by an American millionaire. On his deathbed, he willed this part of the highlands to his wife. But the government of Nova Scotia had other plans for this highland place. Woe well be tied to those who attempt to profit from a widow's misfortune. Back in the 1930s, the government of Nova Scotia expropriated this land from the widow of American millionaire Henry Clay Corson. That expropriation reached down into the very grave of old Henry. Legend has it that because of that expropriation, the ghost of Henry Clay Corson cannot rest. His spirit rises to walk endlessly over the land that once was his. When old Henry was alive, he spent many hours walking the land he developed out of a wilderness. It is said that even during daylight hours, his spirit moves between the birches of his beloved peninsula. When dark shadows fall and the mist sweeps over the highlands, the ghost of Henry Clay Corson wanders the corridors of Celtic Lodge.
here is where time stands still. Employees whisper of hearing someone or something walking the hallways late at night, of doors opening and closing on their own, of seeing an unfamiliar face appearing in a window and just as quickly disappearing. Lodgers cannot shake the feeling of a strong presence in their midst, as if they were being followed, as if they were being watched. Some employees and visitors wonder if there is something other than humans spending a night at Celtic Lodge. In 1926, Henry Clay Corson died and was buried in Akron, Ohio. Later, his wife became much too ill ever to return to Cape Breton. Local legend has it, however, that not only the spirit of old Henry, but that of his wife lives on forever in the highlands of Cape Breton. what keeps knocking at the back door of this farmhouse? And why is there a ghost prowling the upstairs and the hallways of this home? Let the journey begin to a place where not one, but two from the spirit world came home or never left. Off Highway 103, there is a place known as the Jordan Branch Road, which is located not far from Shelburne, Nova Scotia. And in this place stands Mystic Farm. The house was built in 1783. A lot of living and a lot of dying in a place that old. Today's owners are Jack and Jill Nickerson, who operate a greenhouse nursery. Life is normal at Mystic Farms. Normal, that is, until night falls. That's when the ghost of Nina appears. Nina, according to the Nickersons, was one of the original owners. The Nickersons didn't realize their home was haunted was until early morning. one morning. I got up out of bed. Uh, it was in November. Uh, I was on about the second step coming down the stairway, and there was this cold, shivery, ice feeling that went right through me. I turned and I looked towards the spare bedroom and I could see a white figure go into the spare room. One night, the house was full of smoke. Jack woke me up and he says, the house is on fire. Well, anyway, we both came downstairs. We looked all around. We couldn't see any flames. Uh, he went outside. We checked all the other rooms and whatever, we still couldn't find any flames, but the, still, the house was still full of smoke. The new owners not only have to share their home with Nina's spirit, but also with the ghost of a young man who smashed his car against a large boulder on the property some years ago. The ghost of the young man keeps knocking on the door seeking help. From what I can tell, he is still knocking. I always go out and answer the door just to make sure. And a lot of times he will not stop knocking until you do answer the door. Most ghosts want to be left alone. We're told they do become somewhat agitated though when changes are being made to familiar haunts. Jill Nickerson, however, has her own way of accommodating the spirit of Nina. 
I have no concerns about living here. Uh, we are part of Nina's family and she's part of our family. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessup. This is Emmyvale, part of the rolling hills and deep valleys of Prince Edward Island. Time brings changes, and gone from this place are the saw and grist mill that was owned and operated by James Dollar. The only reminder of his presence is the old homestead, and this is his story. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, there lived in the hollow of Emmyvale, Prince Edward Island, a man by the name of James Dollar. Now, old Dollar was not of the faith of the rest of his neighbors, and that was his cross to bear. So let the journey begin to this place, where old Dollar had the last laugh. According to local historian Brendan Campbell, old Mr. Dollar was the only non-Catholic in the area, and his neighbors, especially his close friend Pat McCardle, urged him to become one of them. A Catholic, that is. And McCardle used to chide him all the time, saying, Jim, you are the only non-Catholic here. We give you all our business and that. Why don't you become one of us? And Dollar's patterned answer back to him was, Pat, I will become a Catholic before I die. Dollar knew his days were numbered, that the grim reaper was at his door. Death in the end does come calling, and old Dollar was finally on his deathbed. When his neighbors were told that he was dying, they remembered his promise to convert before passing over. Pat McCardle also remembered and he mounted his fastest steed and was off to fetch the local priest. When they got within a couple of miles of McCardle's home on the way back, Father Duffy turned to McCardle and said, you can ease up on the horse now, Pat. He's gone. With a strange look on his face, Pat said, how do you know, Father? He said, I just know. And sure enough, when they reached Dollar's home, Dollar had passed away. It was not long after Dollar's death as strange things began happening at the saw and grist mill. In the beginning, there was a strange black dog that howled at night, and water in the dam would let go and start the water wheel. Inside the mill itself, the lights would come on late at night and the machinery begin operating. Things became so bad that the people of Emmyvale agreed that old Dollar was back. Plans were made to get rid of his spirit. Father Duffy was summoned, and as the old people said, he put old Dollar in the bottle, and by this we presume he means his soul, and apparently and buried the soul of Dollar in the bottle over on the mill stream bank. And after the dog disappeared and all these strange happenings, they all ceased. For those who are anxious to know where old Dollar is buried, look no further than his old homestead. There, between two maples, lies the body of James Dollar. End of story? Not likely. Wait until next time. But for now, and for Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen.
It was early morning, 1859. The people of Charlottetown were awakening to another day. For no apparent reason, the bell of St. James's Protestant Church began tolling. Witnesses would later testify that as the bell tolled, the church doors would open and standing just inside the church, three women stood staring outside. The minister and his young assistant raced to the church only to find it locked. Who was ringing the bell and why? The bell tolled for the sixth time. When the sexton unlocked the door and both men stepped inside, they saw three women slowly climbing the stairs to the belfry. The bell tolled a seventh time. The bell tolled for the eighth and last time. When the clergy entered the belfry, they found it empty and the bell's rope securely tied. Where were the women and who or what was ringing the bell? Can you see one up there? No, I can't. I don't, I don't understand. The, the bell did ring. There must be someone up there. Oh, well, I heard it too. Well, this is all very strange. The minister and his assistant made a thorough search of the church but could find not a soul. The women just simply vanished. And if someone rang the bell, they were nowhere to be found. Unable to solve the mystery of the tolling bell and the three mysterious women, the minister and sexton locked the church and returned to their homes. Later that day, news spread throughout the town that the Fairy Queen steamer failed to arrive at the Charlottetown Wharf. Was there a connection between the tolling bell, the three mysterious women, and the Fairy Queen steamer? The Fairy Queen had left Picto at sunrise under a fair wind and a calm sea. It was days later when the town's people were told the Fairy Queen had sunk with the loss of all passengers, eight in all, five men and three women. An inquiry would later reveal the captain and crew had deserted the ship, taking the only two lifeboats and leaving the passengers to a watery grave. A plaque on the north wall of St. James's Church is to this very day a reminder of the sinking of the Fairy Queen and that one of its parishioners was a passenger aboard the ill-fated ship. Had the tolling of the bell foretold the pending disaster of the sinking of the Fairy Queen? And were the three women seen in the church the spirits of the women passengers aboard the ill-fated steamer? Or was it all merely a coincidence? To this very day, a maritime mystery. I'm Bill Jessen.
There are graveyards and then there's Sable Island. Our maritime mystery this evening involves a shipwreck, murder, and a bleeding ghost. So let the journey begin to a place of broken ships and restless spirits. There are at least two written versions of this 18th century mystery that we know of. One was written by Thomas Chandler Halliburton, the creator of Sam Slick, and a more recent one by Lyle Campbell. And this is how this maritime mystery unfolds. When the ship Francis was overdue on a voyage from England to Halifax, a search party was sent out from the garrison town to Sable Island, a logical first place to investigate. Besides the crew, there were some 20 passengers on board the Francis, including a Dr. Copeland, his wife, two children, and a maid. When the rescue crew arrived on Sable, they found strewn over the beach wreckage from the Francis, including the personal effects of Prince Edward, Duke of Kent. Bodies were also washed up on shore. With the sun nearly gone and darkness setting in, the officer in charge told his men to bed down for the night and in the morning they would bury the dead. The young officer made his way to one of the huts that were built at the time for shipwreck survivors. When he stepped inside, there was a woman standing by the stove. He noticed her ring finger was missing and dripping with blood. When he asked who she was and where she came from, she fled past him to the outside. The officer followed and watched her running toward the ocean. The woman stopped and stood for a long time looking out to sea. As he watched her, he realized who she was or was not. She was no longer Mrs. Copeland, the wife of the medical officer of the garrison in Halifax, but her ghost. There was on Sable and along the coast of Nova Scotia during the late 18th century, men known as wreckers who would plunder anything that washed up on shore. When one of these wreckers came upon the unconscious body of Mrs. Copeland, the only survivor of the Francis, he assumed she was dead. And when he was unable to get the ring off her swollen finger, he cut it off. The shock and pain brought her back to consciousness. Mrs. Copeland's life, however, was not spared. She was brutally murdered. On his return to Halifax, the officer swore he would find Mrs. Copeland's murderer and return her ring to her family in England. It wasn't long after he arrived back in Halifax that the officer located the watchmaker who bought Mrs. Copeland's ring. The wrecker, however, was never caught. It is said, though, that he suffered a worse fate than the gallows. In his dreams, the ghost of Mrs. Copeland would rise up off the beach to point an accusing and mutilated finger at him. Fishermen on Sable at the time reported seeing the ghost of Mrs. Copeland staring out to sea, waiting perhaps for the return of her severed finger and ring. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen. This maritime tale is from Helen Creighton's ghost story collection, and like all stories of the supernatural, this spirited tale has changed over the years. It happened a long time ago, 
in a graveyard along the foggy coast of Nova Scotia. Two gravediggers struck something other than earth and rock. Had these two young men been warned of what might happen if you disturbed the final resting place of the dead, they would have quickly filled in the unmarked grave and went about their business. But curiosity won the moment. Digging deeper, they uncovered the skeleton remains of someone who passed beyond this life many years before. The grave diggers decided that no harm would be done if they each took a piece of the skeleton as a souvenir. Who would ever know? Certainly not the dead. However, that unholy decision was the beginning of their nightmare. As one of the grave diggers was leaving for work the next morning, he was startled by a tall stranger standing in front of his house. Should he ask her what she wanted? Because of a strong feeling of foreboding, he ignored her. When he arrived at the graveyard, he was about to tell his friend of his encounter with the stranger when the other man blurted out the identical story. Both men tried to put this strange looking person out of their minds and went about caring for the graves. But they were not alone. They were being watched by the stranger in black. Although afraid, they decided to confront her. Slowly, the young woman raised her arm and pointed at the grave, her grave, where the grave diggers had disturbed her eternal rest. It was then that the young men realized who she was and what was happening to them. They were being haunted by the ghost of the woman in the unmarked grave. She wanted her bones back. If they were to rid themselves of this spirit, they now knew what must be done and done quickly. The grave diggers replaced the bones and filled in the grave. When the two young grave diggers left, the spirit returned to her place of everlasting sleep. And then, and only then, with a grave digger set free. In the St. Margaret's Bay area, I'm Bill Jessen. The immigrants who came to Canada brought with them their most prized possessions. In Fredericton, New Brunswick, there's a grandfather's clock that sits high on a mantle it was brought over from Ireland, and it ticks more than just time. The Irish who came across the sea to the Maritimes brought with them not only their personal belongings, but their folklore, superstitions, and perhaps even unspeakable things from the spirit world that dwell in family portraits and even in clocks. Take this fascinating tale by Dorothy Dearborn in her latest New Brunswick Ghost Demons and Things That Go Bump in the Night. This is a story of the Flanagan clock that was brought over from Ireland to Fredericton by Charles Flanagan's grandfather. According to Charles, the clock never worked properly, never chimed when it was supposed to. It worked only in the early morning hours when there was the last gasp of breath from a member of the Flanagan family. One night the clock stuck in the middle of the night. So. When my father got up and so on, they went down and they found Uncle Tom dead, dead. So they didn't think too much about it. At the time, the family lived on St. John Street. The old homestead is still standing. Two weeks after Charles' Uncle Tom died, the clock chimed once more. It was only a couple of weeks later, my mother died. 
And the clock struck again in the middle of the night. And they went down and found the same thing. So it was kind of a weird thing. And then it went on for quite a few years. And then uh, the clock always sat on the mantel. It was just a keepsake. This is not the end of this Irish tale. I am absolutely assured that there's no Blarney attached to the telling of this peculiar story. And in 1937, we had a live-in housekeeper, and uh, the old clock struck again, it chimed in the middle of the night. And so when we come down in the morning to get breakfast, the housekeeper wasn't there, so they went in and found her dead in bed. Enough's enough. Irish tempers flared. The demon clock had to be destroyed before every member of the Flanagan family died. My father, he kind of got cheesed off about then with the clock. He didn't know it. It's the only time it strikes us when somebody dies, and he was getting fed up with it in the family. So he grabbed the clock, and he says, I'll fix that. So he says, it'll never strike again for anybody dying. So he cut the clock all up, little pieces, and burned it and took the metal parts and smashed them all up and sent them to the dump. So that was the end of the clock. So the next time you're browsing in your grandfather's attic or in an old antique shop and you're drawn to the old mantel clock, be wary of what might be living inside the old tick-tock. Lunenburg, Canada's most famous seaport town. Courageous stories of men and ships. There is another story in this town, however, but this is a sad one, one that we are familiar with. It's about a 14-year-old girl who willed herself to die. Sophia McLaughlin was born on March 11th, 1865, and lived in a small cottage on Pelham Street where this family home now stands. When she was 14, Sophia became an apprentice in a dressmaking shop now occupied by Lunenburg Hardware. The owner of the shop discovered $10 was missing. She accused Sophia of stealing the money. Sophia could not convince the owner, her family, or the townspeople she was innocent. One can well imagine the suffering this child must have endured, ashamed and even afraid to venture out on the streets of Lunenburg. And when she did, perhaps singled out as a thief. Had he stuff for a child to endure, alone and deserted? I would think the impact, for example, of being accused of being a thief as a young girl would be probably much more devastating to someone in that sort of community at that stage than it might be nowadays, where in some schools kids compete about what they can pinch from the local shop and see it as a, um, as a much more acceptable thing, or at least not such a, such a total disgrace. I'm sure the impact would have been far greater to such a girl at such a stage. Sophia's pleas of innocence fell on deaf ears. She would spend long hours at the graveside of her two little sisters, wishing that she could join them. And join them she would. Sophia began to will herself to die. As the accusations became more pronounced, she hid herself away in her bedroom. Then one night, she was told a warrant would be issued for her arrest in the morning. It's highly likely that she would have had a far better chance of surviving the experience had not any of her family supported her, in fact, had anybody in that community believed what she said, um, believed that she was not as, as wicked and awful as people must have been believing. Early the next morning, and the last thing Sophia did before death was a letter to her accuser. I am near gone. My hands tremble so that I can scarcely write. When you hear the song, my grave, my grave, keep green, think of me. I am innocent. Goodbye forever, Sophia. Sophia died soon after. A coroner's jury determined death caused by paralysis of the heart brought on by extreme agitation caused by peculiar circumstances, a broken heart. Hearts don't physically break, but there is a wide range of evidence to suggest that 
the effects of stress we can't cope with, particularly unearned or particularly tragic stress and traumatic stress as we now call it, can have a major impact not only on one's mental health but on one's physical health and that may indeed lead to death. The sad story of Sophia McLaughlin was not forgotten. In 1989, the Blue Nose General Radio Service Society of Lunenburg restored not only her position in the community, but the grave site as well. George Lonas. When we think it back on what we've done, when we leave the grave site, we know that Sophia can now rest in peace. Not long after Sophia's death, the shop owner's son confessed to stealing the $10. Sophia died in vain. Bill Jessam, ATV News. An assignment of this nature is such that one must be careful not to allow romance, adventure, and folklore get in the way of facts. When an event is 129 years old, facts sometimes get lost in the storytelling. So, the place to begin to piece the facts together is the public archives of Nova Scotia where the archivists are up to the challenge. As you begin scanning the microfilm of old newspaper clippings, you soon realize that the story of Jerome was not born out of some old salty sea tale, but an accurate account of what really happened following the discovery of the stranger so long ago. Armed with newspaper clippings and documents, my cameraman and I went down to Digby Neck to the very beach where this mysterious man called Jerome was found. There, we met Elizabeth McCullough, a retired school teacher and an authority on the story. On that fateful summer's day in the year 1861, local fishermen of Sandy Cove in Digby Neck watched a strange vessel hovering offshore. She sailed back and forth until darkness fell. The vessel was never seen again by the fishermen of Sandy Cove. Elizabeth McCullough and I retraced the steps of the two local fishermen who discovered Jerome lying near death against a rock the following morning. Can you imagine how surprised they were when they found this uh, half, uh, so to speak, uh, person with no legs? Apparently, uh, that afternoon, though, I guess some of the uh, fisher folks had seen a strange-looking boat out into the bay, and so at night, uh, I assume that he was brought ashore and uh, put beside this rock with uh, a keg of water and some uh, ship's biscuit. The fisherman carried the wounded man to the home of a Mr. Gidney, where he was put to bed and cared for. The villagers speculated on how the half-man, as they would refer to him later, arrived on their shore. Everyone agreed, though, that the strange vessel seen the day before had something to do with abandoning the stranger. The man was questioned by village elders as to his identity. Who put him ashore, and if he came from the mysterious vessel seen in the bay the day before? The stranger appeared frightened and could only mumble a name that sounded like Jerome. Elizabeth McCullough has her own theory on why he remained silent. The amazing thing uh, about Jerome, I think, which uh, everyone wonders about, is the fact that he never spoke. Now, it could be that maybe that he was a mute, or as the, some of the stories tell us, that he probably had his vocal cords uh, severed, and uh, probably this was the reason uh, for it. We're getting ahead of our story, though. Remember, the year was 1861, and the question raised is what was it like to have both legs amputated in the mid-1800s? There are no records as to what caused the amputation of Jerome's legs. When he was found on Sandy Cove Beach in Digby Neck on that summer's morning in 1863, bloodstained bandages indicated that the operation was done that night or the day before. Reg Jabsley, an orthopedic surgeon at the VG, says only one in 10 survived such an operation in those days, and in all likelihood, Anesthesia was not used. Because of that, it would have had to be done very quickly, very fast, to avoid bleeding on the part of the patient, to avoid shock, and because it would have been an extremely painful experience. So we're talking about an amputation being done literally in a couple of minutes by the clock. Dr. Yabsley says early medical records show the most common accidents aboard ships and vessels at the time 
were caused by chains, cables, or ropes. Amputations commonly occur because a part is uh, caught in a loop of rope or cable or chain. And quite unwittingly, uh, an, a command is given or something happens, and a chain is dropped or a sail is dropped or a winch starts winding, and the uh, le leg or legs are caught in the loop of the rope or chain, such as I'm demonstrating here. And this way, both would be snapped off as cleanly as they could be with a saw or a knife. I think in this case, this is probably what, what most likely happened. Um, it would be unusual, I think, for, for somebody to injure both legs, say, uh, as a result of a, with a crush, and have to have them both amputated in this same fashion. So I think the most likely thing is they caught it in a rope, the rope tightened, and, and amputated both legs tr traumatically. Much has been written about the identity of Digby County's famous mystery man, but nothing documented as to who he really was. Hugh Morehouse, who lived all his life in Sandy Cove, believed Jerome's abandonment was deliberate and planned by the crew of the mysterious vessel that was seen a mile offshore the day before. Seems that it must have been planned in some way. That it, it wasn't an accident, I don't think, by any means. It was planned to get rid of the poor devil, whoever he was. Retired school teacher and an authority on Jerome, Elizabeth McCullough, says many theories were advanced as to who Jerome was, but they were just that, theories. There is another uh, connection that uh, we should look at, and that is the uh, one from New Brunswick. Following his rescue from the shores of Digby Neck, the stranger was cared for by villagers of Sandy Cove for several weeks. Because of his dark complexion, the elders of the village believed that Jerome might be from Spain, Italy, or France. So it was decided to send him to the Acadian village of Mategan to live with a John Nicholas who spoke several languages. Unfortunately, the linguist was unable to communicate with Jerome in any language. From the Nicholas house, Jerome was once again moved to another home and for the last time. He went to live with a Mrs. Didier Como of the village of St. Alphonse de Clare, which was known then as Chedecon. There, Jerome remained for some 30 years, mostly in silence, until his death. Whenever the story of Jerome is talked about, invariably, a New Brunswick connection is raised. Some people believe that New Brunswick authorities, in an attempt to avoid financial responsibility, dumped him on the Nova Scotia side of the Bay of Fundy. Barry Cahill of the Public Archives of Nova Scotia located a New Brunswick document hey, from the poor masters of Chipman Parish to the New Brunswick legislature requesting financial aid for a man whom they described as foreign, insane, indigent, and frozen. According to the document, the man was found in the wilderness by a lumbering party in 1859. It's important to remember the date of this document, 1859. A second document was from a New Brunswick doctor to the overseers of the poor in the parish of Chipman, requesting expenses of 25 pounds for amputating a man's legs in March of 1861. That's two years after the first New Brunswick request. The connection certainly doesn't stand up when you check the date of a Nova Scotia document that was submitted to the Nova Scotia legislature by the village elders of Sandy Cove requesting financial support for looking after Jerome. Remember, the date of the document was September 1863. That's four years after the first New Brunswick request surfaced. So, comparing these dates, there appears to be no New Brunswick connection. Which leaves us where? It is a mystery because he took everything with him to the grave and no one really knows to this day where he was, where he came from or who he was. On a fierce and stormy night in 1908, a night not fit for man, beast or vessel, and with the surf pounding against the Acadian shore, death finally claimed Jerome. Who was this man of mystery and where did he come from? 
And how did he end up frightened and alone on Sandy Cove Beach 45 years before death claimed him in his early 70s? Dr. Reginald Yabsley theorized that Jerome's amputation was a result of a shipboard accident rather than some foul deed. But what if it wasn't an accident? What if it was some terrible and sinister circumstance that led to the amputation of his legs? Both Elizabeth McCullough and Hugh Moorhead believe it was deliberate and perhaps he was abandoned by pirates. We will never know the answer to any of these questions. We do know, however, that Jerome's unmarked grave is here in this cemetery in Matagan, perhaps somewhere in this vicinity of the old section of the graveyard. Nameless in life and nameless in death. Bill Jessam, ATV News. No one, not even the bravest, would spend a night alone in a small fishing shack on Cape Breton's southern coast. The shack was at one time a popular place for fishermen who waited out a storm, a place to catch 40 winks and to share a meal with other fishermen while discussing the state of the industry. Most of the temporary homes that dotted the coastline were welcome places for weary fishermen, but not this one not since those horrible screams were heard coming from somewhere inside. One brave fisherman who investigated told the villagers the scream sounded like the shrieking of men in great agony. What puzzled and terrified him though was when he looked inside, the shack was empty. Some weeks later, a trawler, the Mikado, not far offshore, foundered in a gale. And because of the storm, any rescue attempt was impossible. Above the wind, the voices of the fishermen on board could be heard screaming for help. When morning came and the storm passed, the sea gave up the bodies of the fishermen. The young fishermen who were washed up on shore were carried to a makeshift morgue. The bodies were taken to the very shack where the mysterious screams were first heard. It was then the people of this remote fishing community understood the mystery surrounding the screams. What the people heard coming from this shack was a forerunner, a messenger of death. In this instance, it was a sinking of the trawler Mikado and the drowning of her crew. I'm Bill Jessen. What separates this home from other homes in the south end of Halifax, Nova Scotia are two things. First, the window. And no matter how often it is replaced, it turns black. And the second thing, this is a residence of the Witches of Roby Street. 
This home is a familiar landmark in South End, Halifax. It was built in the 1840s for William Caldwell, the city's first elected mayor. The house, known as the Roby Street Palace, has a history of being haunted. Legend has it that an old man who lived in the home spent long hours peering out the window. On one such occasion, he watched several witches dancing on the veranda. The old man knew better than the spy on them, and we all know what curiosity did to the cat. The old man kept watching as the witches did their dance of death. being spied upon, and they would teach his mortal a lesson that he and his descendants would not soon forget. The witches became angry, and in their dance of death, they turned their black magic against the old man by turning the window black. No matter how often the glass is replaced, legend has it, it immediately turns black. The witches also put a curse on the old man and his home. They conjured up a not-so-friendly ghost to inhabit the house, and it did. According to some students of architecture, there is an explanation for the blackened window, and it has absolutely nothing to do with a witch's curse. When the home was being built, the owner wanted a series of unbroken windows around the house, but sliding doors prevented that, so a fake one was installed for balance. Ah, but we are not dealing with logic. We're dealing with folklore, not fact. There are those who prefer the story of the witches who put a curse on the old man and his home. And the legend says, to this very day, if you're near the Roby Street Palace at the exact moment, that magic time between dusk and darkness, the witches can still be seen doing their dance of death. For Maritime Mysteries, I'm Bill Jessen.